It's kind of a typical molecular biology type of lab. People work at open lab benches. Lots of chemicals here. <laughs> yeah, we do a lot of chemistry, a lot of molecular biology. We have uh, other rooms back there where we do synthetic organic chemistry and more uh, uh, physical chemistry. Okay. And this is your office. Yeah, my office is in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay, what is your name? Jack Shostak. Oh, and where do you work? Where are we? Uh, we're uh, uh, here at my lab at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh -huh. And uh, are we alone in the universe? <laughs> That's what we'd like to find out, right? I mean, we have different approaches. The astronomers are looking directly and we're trying to figure out from uh, lab work, you know, how likely it is that there could be life out there elsewhere. And how likely is it? Well, that's why we're doing the experiments. I don't know. <laughs> no guesses? Anywhere from 0% to 100%? Well, okay. There, there's one thing that makes me a little bit lean towards the side that there might be life out there, which is uh, time and again we've done uh, experiments try, trying to address problems that initially we had no idea how to, how to solve. And, and then it, in the end, they turn out to be essentially trivial. So, so that's happened repeatedly for steps on the way from chemistry to, to life. So, so if that keeps up, then maybe it would be easy for life to emerge uh, in many different environments. But you know, there could be some hard steps that, that we don't know about. Right, have you ever seen a UFO? No. No. <laughs> you've, all, every object you've seen in the sky was always identified. Well, you know, uh, uh, not being an astronomer, I can't pick out um, all the stars. So you galaxies. defer to your astronomical colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, so what do you know about aliens? Aliens. What kind of aliens? I don't know. What, what kind do you know about? Uh, well, I don't really know what you're talking about. I mean, are you talking about, like, intelligent aliens? Or any type, aliens, any type of aliens. Any type of aliens. Any type of life that's not on the, on the Earth. Oh, any type of life that's not on the Earth. Well, we don't know anything, we don't have any examples, so you know, uh, all that we can do is infer from the laws of chemistry and physics uh, what might be out there, what might have evolved on other planets. Okay, are you trying to make artificial life in your lab? Yes, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to understand how life emerged from the chemistry of the early Earth by just studying that kind of chemistry and seeing if we can, you know, either rule out uh, ideas or pathways that, that, you know, simply don't work or, you know, can we identify a series of steps that would make the whole pathway easy. And uh, often in the origin of life studies, people talk about whether information was first or metabolism first or even membranes were first. Are, are you trying to work on one of those three or are you trying to work on all three at the same time? We're basically working on all three at the same time. Um, you know, I mean, membranes are nice because they're they're self-assembling. You know, the process of membrane formation is well understood. The molecules. You can do that in simple. your lab. You can make a membrane in Anybody your lab. Anybody can do it. You can just take <laughs> soap and shake it up in water, and you get membranes. <laughs> it's not <laughs> hard. But how about a bot? There are two layers, all right? They're the hydrophobic, the hydrophilic. Right. So, yeah. is when I make a soap bubble, that's not a bilayer, is it? If you make a soap bubble in air, no, you've, you have monolayers flanking a layer of water. But if you, if you shake up soap in, in water at, at the right pH, you'll spontaneously make bilayer membranes, and they'll form sheets, and they'll close up into nice round vesicles that will capture whatever other molecules are floating around. So that part's really easy. When bacteria divide, they have to remake the part of this, the, their membranes where the division took place in between the two new yeah, cells. Right. How did they do that? Can you do it, what, what they're doing? So, what we, we've, so, so as I was just saying, just making 
these bilayer membrane vesicles is very easy. But the process of how they could grow and divide is much more interesting, actually. And we, we've studied that a lot over the last decade. And uh, we've actually discovered many really simple ways that these vesicles can grow and divide. And but the are processes they... are very simple and very interesting. But, but for example, right now there's some, you're repairing something in your colon, you're making a new colon cell and it's dividing to, mm -hmm. through mitosis. And so it has to make a new, not me, well, I guess it's a membrane or cell. Yeah, but the way that cells do it now is, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty complicated. It's controlled by thousands of proteins, none of which existed you know, at the time of the origin of life, right? So we have to look for really simple physical and chemical processes that could essentially do the same thing. So, so what we found is that if you take, if you make vesicles in a really simple, spontaneous way, like, like I said, just shaking up soap and water at the right pH, they tend to make these little vesicles, like bubbles, with, with multiple bilayers. And when you do that and then feed those with more fatty acids, they grow into filaments. It's really remarkable. Uh -huh. What pH are we talking? Oh, seven, eight. So neutral. You know, Neutral-ish, yeah. Until it's a little bit basic. Yeah. It depends on the details of what molecules are making up the membrane. So is this going on in the, for example, the surf down here at Boston Harbor, the waves are breaking. <laughs> is that, is that they got some, sometimes you see foam, sea foam. Yeah. That's not what you're talking about, is it? Uh, that's not what I'm talking about because those are, are air bubbles. I'm talking about things happening in the water. But the air bubbles uh, are surrounded by something. Well, yeah, but we don't want to encapsulate air, right? We want to encapsulate water, water right. with molecules, <laughs> okay. right? So okay, got to like, To be water. like a cell, right? <coughs> okay. Um, so it turns out there's actually multiple ways that this growth and division can work just using physics and chemistry. You don't need any biological anything. Right, but I'm interested in if you trace back the biosynthetic pathways which make these membranes, they right. get, you can look at, oh, we don't need okay. this part, don't need this part, let's trace it back as far as we can yeah. to the simplest bi right. real biological way of doing that. What is that? Okay, so if you, if you look at modern membranes, they're... Bacterial? Well, everything in biology, right? They, they basically uh, use phospholipids. That's the main class of molecules. There's a lot of other fancy stuff, but, mm -hmm. but basically phospholipids, okay? And they, they're great for modern cells because those membranes are intrinsically a barrier to other molecules getting crossed because cells don't want all their good stuff to leak out. Yes, yes. You know, they don't want bad stuff to come in. And modern cells control everything that goes in and out using protein machines, okay? So now look, if we think backwards to earlier, simpler times, you want a membrane that is more permeable because the cell has to get access to stuff that was made out in the environment. And you want the membrane molecules, presumably, to be somewhat simpler. Do you want the whole thing to be permeable or do you want to have pores here and there? Well, I mean, you, we could, we could talk about the details, but you know, one way or another stuff has to get across right, the membrane. Right. And so it turns out, if you think about what a phospholipid is, it's basically a couple of fatty acids hooked together with a glycerol and a phosphate, and then you can put lots of other stuff on it, right? But the basic component, the most important component is a fatty acid molecule. But I heard that there was a, a fundamental difference between archaea and eubacteria when, with ether and ester bonding. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah it, do you, I mean, which uh, of those two do you think came first? The common ancestor of archaea and bacteria, do you think it had an ester bond or an ether bond? Well, I think the ester bonds are a lot easier to make, so ester. that probably came first, yeah, that's the, the ester bonds. That's the eubacteria? Yeah, and the eukaryotes, yeah. And the eukaryotes, yeah. okay. So we have the same type of bonds in our bilipid layers as bacteria do, yes. although we're more closely related in many ways to archaea. Yeah. Right. right. But okay. I, I think, you know, the, the evolution of, of, uh, of, uh, of the membrane machinery has, has been a long process, and uh, there's plenty of time to have many, many variations on the molecules uh, that make up membranes. But I think if you want to look for the simplest, earliest starting points, to me, um, fatty acids make the most sense. I, you know, I wouldn't rule out other possibilities, mm -hmm. but just uh, ester-linked fatty acids, well, just fatty acids, not linked to anything, oh. is what you can make really primitive membranes out of, and they have all the right kinds of properties for primitive cells. So why have ester in there? Well, that came later, right? So, so you, well, let's, 
think about the most primitive membranes made of just fatty acids. So these are basically soaps if they're salts. So if, if you make a bilayer membrane out of just fatty acids, mm -hmm. or you, know, you can mix in fatty alcohols, you can mix in all kinds of other stuff, they're relatively permeable. Right? So, so molecules, small molecules can get across the membrane. They are very dynamic in the sense that the molecules that make up the membrane are always going in and out from solution back oh. into the membrane. That's very dynamic. And that allows molecules to exchange between different vesicles. Now, these fatty acids that make up these membranes, are they, if I go out to, I don't know, the hot spring somewhere, are they around, bubbling around in the soup? Well, I think Where? any place you go on the modern Earth, you're most likely to find contamination from biology. Right? Contamin well, how about a, a carbonaceous chondrite? Lands, boom, uh, lands in a lake. Right? You find a huge complexity of amphiphilic molecules that can form membranes. Amphilic? Uh, Does that mean fatty that means acid? Is? Fatty acids are one example. They have a, a mm -hmm. sort of oily part and a and another part that likes to be in the water. Uh -huh. But there are lots and lots of molecules like that. And so yeah, you, you find molecules in carbonaceous chondrites that can make membranes. Mm -hmm. That was done a long time ago by Dave Diemer, among other people. So membranes are falling from the sky four billion years ago. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're the, I think, the easiest part of making a primitive okay, cell. Okay, so let's say, let's assume that part's done. We, fixed, we figured out how to do that. <laughs> that just comes naturally. How about the uh, information? Right, so to really make a cell that can start to evolve, you need, you need heritable information, right? And that means you need molecules that can code for information, that can pass that information on from one generation to the next, and those molecules also have to be able to do something useful, okay? So if we, again, if we look at modern biology, what fits the bill, it's RNA. Okay, so that's been obvious for a long time. The question is, how do you make RNA on the primitive Earth? And here you have a lot of different opinions, right? Ranging from that's completely ridiculous and impossible to, well, maybe it's not so hard, and let's try to fill in the gaps. And what see do you, if we can where, I guess it. the second opinion is yours? It, yeah, I, I think there's been enormous uh, progress in the last decade in, in uh, learning about the fundamental aspects of the chemistry that would lead up to the building blocks of RNA, to, to nucleotides. Uh, a lot of interesting surprises, a lot of new chemistry. Uh, the story's not complete, there's a lot to learn, but it's been a very fruitful area of investigation. It's not stuff that we've worked on in my lab. This is other people. You don't make RNA in this lab then? We uh, are concentrating on the parts of the pathway to life where we, we have the building blocks and we ask how do they get together? to act like a cell. Uh -huh. So we're relying on our colleagues like John Sutherland and Matt Pounder and, and Ram Krishnamurthy and others to, to work out how to make those building blocks. We're working on separate questions. Okay, so you have the membrane, you have the RNA, and yeah. I guess you, are you importing also pre-made metabolic pathways? Or are you trying to invent those? That's something we're kind of just gradually getting into. So we have, we have membranes, like you said, nucleotides and RNA. Uh, the nucleotides we can supply from the outside. They can cross the membrane and get into the, our, our protocell models. Uh, we use peptides for different parts of this story as well. And we're also starting to think about chemical sources of energy. It would sort of keep everything charged up and keep the whole cycle of growth and division running. What type of redox reactions are you considering? So there's a lot of redox chemistry involved in making nucleotides. And there could be, in terms of making energetic molecules, um, we're, we're really just getting into this. It's, it's basically all um, cyanide chemistry and phosphate chemistry. 
we, we don't know the right molecules that could deliver energy to, to primitive cells yet, but that's something we're just starting to work on. So in high school, you learn that all life uses ATP. Right. But then you go to college, you learn that, well, ATP is one energy source, and then there's transmembrane potentials, another right. energy source, then there's NADH, and the whole bunch. It gets more and more complicated. Right. But if we try to strip away those complications, particularly if they evolved later, what do you think the first energy sources were for these earliest cells? Right. So uh, what, what I think uh, on the nucleotide and RNA side is, so we, we use, uh, for most of our experiments now, a, a model that may be completely artificial, right? But it's a useful way of studying RNA. We use an RNA. artificial model, Jack. We, we, we <laughs> use nucleotides that are activated in a particular chemical way. So they're already in a kind of, they're like triphosphates. They're like ATP, GTP. Mm -hmm except that, let me back up a bit, the triphosphates, like ATP, are perfect for highly evolved modern cells because they're highly charged, so they're not going to leak out, right? But they're not very reactive by themselves, okay? So they don't go around doing all kinds of spontaneous reactions. They need enzymes to, to do um, what they do. Which is what you want. Which you is control you want your energy for, to control things, right? Yeah. So once you're highly evolved and you have yeah. good enzymes, yes. nucleoside triphosphates are the perfect substrates. But you couldn't possibly start off that way. So you would want something more reactive and something probably less charged, so it would be easier for it to get across the membrane, if it's, especially if it's being made in the outside environment. It's got to get to the inside of the cell to, to do RNA replication. So the molecules I, we use were invented by Leslie Orgel several decades ago. What are they called? They're called phosphorimidazolides. Could you say that again? <laughs> Phosphorimidazolides. Phosphorimidazolides. They basically have... Uh, a kind of imidazole group on what the... What is imidazole? Imidazole is, is a little heterocycle. It's got... It's, it's a ring with carbon and nitrogen okay. five, uh, atoms. Five points? A five-membered ring, and there's a methyl group hanging off in one okay. place. Right. And when you put that on the phosphate, you get something which is uh, quite reactive. So it will polymerize on a template without an enzyme. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... It's, uh, depending on the pH, it's, it's, it's uh, close to neutral in charge, so it can get across membranes fairly easily. Uh, so it, it's, it's a good model. We don't necessarily think that those were the exact high-energy activated nucleotides that were around early. That's something that we're trying to figure out. Well, if I go to hot springs or the hydrothermal vents, well, do I see this amidazole? No, if you go to hot springs or hydrothermal vents, you see biology. You see modern biology. Oh, I right? see. Okay. And what would if if the chemical that you just mentioned, which I can't pronounce, amidazole, but if that were at a hydrothermal vent, would I mean, are they coming out and then just being eaten, or is that thing not something that we should expect that, there? You, you wouldn't expect it. Uh, all of the 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 kind of. Uh, the chemistry, the, 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 the redox chemistry that begins with cyanide and, and uh, hydrosulfide and uh, would lead up to sugars and nucleotides and amino acids, uh, that couldn't really go on in the modern environment. I mean, basically, the Earth has been oxidized by biology. Uh, you know, our, our atmosphere has 20% oxygen, right? That wasn't there uh, on the early Earth. Everything was completely anaerobic. Speaking uh, of that 20%, do you think it's controlled by biology? You think somehow that 20% is regulated by life? In other words, well, some type of regulation going on? I think there's, there's pretty good evidence that at various times in the past, there's been both more or less oxygen. Right, but that, so, that's not what I asked, though. Well, obviously, there are feedback mechanisms. That doesn't mean that, you know... Are they biologically the mediated? Is, uh, uh, no, well, I, I'm not, again, it depends exactly what you mean by that. Uh, obviously, some of the feedback mechanisms, I mean, if you want to think about what's controlling the level of oxygen, mm -hmm. um, you need to think about the sources and the sinks, mm -hmm. right? And some of those are biological and some of those are geophysical. And I think that people still don't understand all of the feedback mechanisms, all the sources yeah. and sinks and feedbacks that control this. That's an active area of investigation. Sounds like you're a chemist. Are you, you're a bio, did you study biochemistry? 
I started off as a biologist, and I've at various times become you know, more on the chemistry side or more on the biology side. So right now I'm more on the chemistry side because we're trying to solve problems in chemistry. Now, you got a Nobel Prize for telomere research, I think. Right. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, and you, I guess, switched telomeres is something that only eukaryotes have, and now you're, I guess, obsessed with prokaryotes. So what qualifies no, you I'm, as... I'm, I'm obsessed with the origin of life, which well, is that's long... Well, pro, that's prokaryotes, not eukaryotes. No, right? it depends how you define prokaryotes. Prokaryotes gives... The, I mean, that's a term used for uh, a, a collection of, of modern uh, microbes. Both the bacteria, the eubacteria, and the archaea are lumped together as prokaryotes. It's a term that a lot of evolutionary people don't really like mm -hmm. because they don't have necessarily, they're not a clade, right? right? Like invertebrates or something. Yeah, right. So uh, anyway, I'm not really uh, focused on on aspects of modern biology. I'm interested in that transition from complicated chemistry to the really simplest beginnings of biology. This is, a, I guess, molecular evolution sometimes called it? People, uh, yeah, people, when they talk about molecular evolution are often talking about phylogenetic analysis of, you know, the history of life by looking at, you know, DNA sequences or protein sequences. We're uh, interested in um, the earliest steps that would lead to the beginnings of that kind of progression. Okay, so how many people, you're working on the origin of life, uh, aren't you? Yes. Absolutely. How many people in the world are working on this? <laughs> well, again, it depends what you count. In, in, in terms of, you know, if you took everybody in the world who's working on, say, prebiotic chemistry and very simple life forms, maybe up to sort of the, the beginnings of translation in the genetic code, I, it's not more than a couple of hundred people. A couple of hundred. Hmm. Do you think there should be, I guess you think there should be more. <laughs> uh, I think that it would be nice <coughs> if, um, if more, you know, real chemists were interested in this problem. <laughs> As opposed to <laughs> fake chemists or what? Well, you know, most of the field of modern chemistry is people are focused on um, on other kinds of problems, right? Sort of classical synthetic chemistry is always focused on, you know, what's the hardest thing I can make? Mm. You know, we, that's not really the problem here. We're making simple molecules, but we don't know exactly how to do it in a way that, that could occur naturally. So it's a different kind of emphasis. Uh, you know, we're not trying to make... Uh, complicated things, just relatively simple molecules. We, we need to understand the physical chemistry of how they behave, how they get together, uh, how, how they work in, in, in collections of molecules. How about, are you trying to simulate or emulate an environment in which are the best candidates for the origin of life, like a hydrothermal vent or a pool, a, I don't know, a tidal pool or something, a warm little pond? I don't hear you talk in that language. Right, well, I think we're not quite at that level yet? I mean, I mean we're, we're, we're sort of pushing up against that. I mean, we, we have a, a, a geochemical, geophysical scenario that, that we like, that we think is consistent with what we've learned about membrane and RNA behavior. Oh, what is that? What is that? It, it's basically uh, a, an environment uh, kind of like, like Yellowstone Lake, mm -hmm. uh, a freshwater surface lake, but, but with hydrothermal circulation, uh -huh. you know, water being circulated through, mm -hmm. through the rocks. Um, you know, bringing up ions and having, giving, you know, streams of hot water coming out of vents, right. like you have in, in, in Yellowstone. Uh, I think that kind of environment where you could accumulate organic materials to high concentrations and where you could have fluctuations in temperature and you'd have currents to move things around, I think that's a really attractive idea for, for the kind of model we're thinking about. So every shock comes to mind in that context. Do you, you work with him at all? Uh, not directly, no. I mean, I, you know, I know some of his work. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot that we need to learn about, um, you know, the, the, the ionic equilibria in such environments, the organic chemistry that could go on, so on, yeah. 
Okay, so I, I think I asked you the question about inflammation, metabolism, and membranes. And you said that you're trying to get these three together. Anything specific you're doing? Like, hey, get together, you guys. Uh, <laughs> you're trying to well, shove we, an RNA okay. inside of a membrane or something? Well, I can tell you one, one uh, really simple experiment. Uh, it was kind of a breakthrough that we had a couple of years ago. For many years, we had wanted to show that we could have RNA molecules inside a membrane vesicle add activated nucleotides from the outside, from the environment, have them cross the membrane, go inside, and copy some of the RNA to make a complementary strand, right? But we couldn't do it for a long time. We didn't know how to do it because the RNA chemistry requires a lot of magnesium ions to oh. catalyze the, the reactions. The fatty acid membranes are destroyed by high concentrations of magnesium. They just crystallize out. Oh. Okay, so they looked incompatible with each other. And then a very talented graduate student in the lab, uh, Kate Adamala, uh, figured out that if you don't have free magnesium, but you, you complex it with citrate, uh, that has a remarkable effect in that those complexed ions don't destroy the membranes. So they're all fine. And it still lets the RNA chemistry go on. So mm -hmm. now all of a sudden everything became compatible and we could start to do RNA copying chemistry inside these very simple uh, membranes. Uh -huh. So that was, for us, it's a big step because you know, we still have a lot of problems to solve in terms of RNA replication. But it made us more optimistic because if we can solve the rest of us, we really think we should be able to do RNA replication inside protocell membranes. Is there any evidence that uh, magnesium would be complexed with citrate in some natural environment? Well, once again, I think this is um, maybe a, the best way to think of it. It's a proof of principle experiment. Mm -hmm. okay. there, there is at least one demonstrated way now that it might happen. I mean, citrate's kind of interesting because it's such a central metabolite. Uh -huh, yeah. I don't know if that's meaningful or just a red herring. Maybe there are other ways of doing it, short acidic peptides. For example, if you look in the heart of modern RNA polymerase, the huge protein enzyme that copies RNA, it's got a little peptide loop with some acidic residues, and it binds magnesium, and it presents it in just the right way in the active site. Does that mean there's some connection all the way back to how RNA was first copied? I know, it's interesting, right? Could you have complexed it with that thing instead of the citrate? Um, we're trying. It, the, doing it in the simplest ways we've thought of so far hasn't, hasn't really worked, but uh, we have some interesting ideas, so we're, we're not giving up on that approach at all. Okay, so it sounds like you're working on a hard problem and that you haven't, have yet to make life that would crawl up and say, hello, oh, Jack. Yeah. Or, right. No, that's, we have a, a lot of steps to solve before we get there. On the other hand, it's been very exciting because we have solved a lot of the problems that looked really hard at the beginning. Well, how many such problems are there? 10, 20, 1,000? <laughs> well, uh, on the RNA side alone, I, I wrote a review several years ago saying there's, like, there's eight big problems that are standing in the way. Uh -huh. And I think we, you know, we've more or less solved maybe three or four of those. We have these kinds of proof of principle solutions for a couple of the others. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple that um, are still looking like hard problems, so more to think about. Is it, are you looking at all at the problem of, you know, you, your body's made out of 20 amino acids, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a redundancy in the, the triplet codes. There's 64 possibilities only coding for 20, and right. some of that redundancy is often used to say, hey, these were the first amino acids, and then these other ones are kind of add-ons, and they evolved later. Now, do you have any insight into that issue? What were the uh, first amino acids? Yeah, I don't, I don't really have a lot of insight into that. I, I mean, I think, um, you know, one, one way to at least start thinking about that is to look at the chemical pathways that can give rise to amino acids yes. on the early Earth. So, and there are a lot of different ways to make amino acids, right? It's not hard to make amino acids. Um, but if you look at this, uh, new, these new pathways that have been worked out in the Sutherland lab, 
they, they lead to uh, many, but not all of the biological amino acids. Now, you know, if, you, if there are some that, that don't emerge easily from that chemistry, does that mean we just haven't worked out the right pathway yet? Or does it mean that they came later and maybe only came uh, once biology was starting to evolve new catalysts? We, it, it's kind of hard to say. Why but is it, there it, 20? Why not 10 or 50 or 100? Right. Well, um, you know, good question. Uh, I think the, the way to get at that kind of question is to do experiments, right? And so there are people who are uh, making large libraries of sequences, and they'll make proteins made of subsets of the modern amino acids, or, or, or maybe subsets plus some different amino acids. And, you know, and then you can evolve new proteins from those libraries and see how they behave. Um, I remember talking to, to Mil Stanley Miller about the Yuri Miller experiment, and they talked about how they could make many, many types of amino acids. And right. matter of fact, there are lots of amino acids in, the, in Murchison. And so, right. But there was one that was very common that wasn't used by life. I forget the right. name of it. it had it's a probably little... alpha amino acid. Yes, acid. yes. So why didn't life use that? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, uh, making those, um, there's a class of amino acids that uh, have two, two groups on the central carbon, and they're, they're harder to make, right? Um, so it may be a, a, a problem in biosynthesis that they're, they're harder to make, and that once you have enzymes, you don't really need them. Um, yeah, so I, th I think, you know, if you look at the Miller-Urey synthesis or you look at the amino acids in meteorites, you find just every possibility, right? There are too many. I think if you want to actually get started, what you want is chemistry that's going to give you a subset of amino acids, a restricted set. And that will make it much easier to have short peptides. Short being two, three, four? Yes, like that, you know, I don't know. Two to six, right? Um, that could actually do something. If you if you have a hundred amino acids and you're just randomly stringing all hundred different amino acids together, the chance of getting anything useful seems to me to be very small. But if you could make, say, in a particular environment, you could make acidic peptides. I mean, acidic amino acids like aspartate. Maybe you could make acidic peptides in one environment. Maybe in a different environment, you could make hydrophobic peptides or some slightly other kind of environment. You could make basic peptides. That, that's the kind of thing that we need to think about, is how to get things that could be useful, that could actually have some kind of function early on, just, just from the chemistry and physics of the environments. Now, the um, astronomers have found lots and lots of planets. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and it looks like Earth-like planets are pretty common in the universe. Yeah. And it looks like water is very, very common. Indeed. So, if, and because the amino acids were falling from the sky in carbonaceous chondrites, I, as an astrophysicist, I would say, well, that's probably the case everywhere in the universe. Right. So it's kind of like, well, all of these ingredients for life are everywhere, but maybe it's the recipe that is hard, or maybe the recipe isn't even hard. We don't know. Do you think the, re although it's hard for you, do you think the recipe for life, given the ingredients, I guess you must be in the mindset of it must, the recipe must be difficult because I can't find it. Or is that... No, no, you see, I, I think I, my view is that it's an interesting problem, right? And we have to study the underlying chemistry and work out how, how you can start from simple things like cyanide and, and make building blocks of biology. Uh, and, you know, and like I said, I don't, I don't really think these huge mixtures are, are the right recipe. I think... What, what do you mean huge mixtures? Like you get in meteorites where oh, you I have 100 or 1,000 amino acids. I like the a kind of simpler, more focused chemistry that might give us 10 or 20 amino acids. And that would give us, you know, not 50 different nucleotides, but maybe four, mm -hmm. right? That would, that would give us a subset of molecules that you could actually start building interesting larger structures from. How about the idea of, you know, water? Do you think water is uh, necessary? Do you, you, you like that? Do you think if there's life elsewhere in the universe, that it too will be water-based? I think that's the most likely answer, but again, you know, how can you get at that, right? So one way is, well, let's do some experiments. Let's see if we can 
Let's see if we can design life in a different solvent. Do you use any other solvents? Well, there, there was a very interesting series uh, of papers 15 or 20 years ago uh, from a group in Japan uh, showing exactly how to make membranes in uh, nonpolar solvents. Okay, so, you know, think Titan, right? Lakes of uh, methane and ethane. Okay, that's, that's hard to work with in the lab, but so let's go to, say, decane, right? Nice nonpolar organic solvent. You can make membranes that self assemble in decane. Mm -hmm. They're inside out, the polar parts are on the inside, the nonpolar parts stick out into the solvent. They make beautiful membranes, they make vesicles. That part looks easy enough. Can you make a genetic polymer that would work in a solvent like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot more challenging. Okay. That's kind of a pretty interesting chemical challenge to think about. How about the idea of, um, now, you, can have, you have a solid, a liquid, and a gas, and when those three phases get together, that's an interesting environment, or you can have a liquid-gas interface, or you can have a liquid-solid interface. So there's two, two, or three. <laughs> Do you think you need the three? Do you think you need liquid, solid, and gas in an interface to make in an interesting way to make this recipe for life, or do you get away with just two? Well, the kind of environment that we've been thinking about the most is kind of the, the whole large-scale environment and would involve all three. So in the atmosphere, there's a lot of chemistry that makes high-energy compounds cyanide and cyanide derivatives, right? So, so cyanide HCN. HCN, right. And so that will rain out into liquid environments mm -hmm. like surface ponds and lakes. But I also mentioned before this, this groundwater circulation that will bring, uh, you know, ions, uh, up, up, uh, leach them out of the rocks and bring them up in, into the water. So, so three you phases. Have three phases there. So you like three phases. Do you think do. the origin of life community is kind of there's a consensus that we probably should use three phases? I don't know if there's any consensus about <laughs> anything in the origins of life community. It's a pretty fractious community. Okay. Do you fight? <laughs> What's the biggest controversy among you that you're still fighting about? You go to a conference and say, oh, I, he's stupid because he thinks that. And he says, oh, no, you're stupid because you think that. Is there anything like that? Well, you know, I think uh, there, there's, there's been uh, some synthesis in that I think more people realize that you need all of these, you know, you need the information, you need compartmentalization, you need energy sources. Um, it's not really that useful to think of them in isolation, although that's, you know, you can start off that way, but eventually you have to bring everything together, right? So I think there's agreement on that. Uh, on how to do it, there's not agreement. Well, I remember reading, a, I think, Daniel Segre and, uh, and Freeman Dyson talked about the garbage peg model in which metabolism first. Forget about right. this information. We, the, meta the information is in the structure and the chemical composition of the bag, and then it does all kinds of interesting things. Right. You don't need to have a code yet to have information built into the structure of the chemistry. What do you think of that idea? Uh, I don't think it's physically realistic. Because? Because getting specific catalysis of reactions is not so easy. Right? This goes back to uh, models like um, from, from Stuart Kaufman, right, where you have large collections of molecules and, and this guy catalyzes the formation mm -hmm. of this guy and it catalyzes the catalytic formation of something else, catalyt you know, autocatalytic cycles emerging spontaneously from large networks. And you know, it's easy to do in the computer, but I don't think it will happen in, real, in reality. Oh. Well, I, okay. And the, and the reason I, I, I think that comes from experiments, right? So we have done a lot of work in, in, in my lab in, in the past in trying to evolve catalysts made out of either RNA or DNA or protein from random sequences, right? And they're rare, right? They're not incredibly rare so that it's impossible to get them. But they're also not incredibly common. Right? So if a catalyst is present at, say, 1 in 10 to the 10th random sequences, you're not going to have a bunch of random sequences all suddenly starting to catalyze their own synthesis. It's just not going to happen.
Oh, even if they're isolated inside of a membrane and their concentrations are 10,000 times higher inside the membrane and therefore they do some special <laughs> thing to the membrane to make it permeable to some types of chemicals and not others? Or Yeah, I, you know, I think the autocatalytic network that's going to take off like that is going to be based on small RNA molecules okay. that are replicating. <laughs> okay, small, by small, how many nucleotides? Well, with the things that we're interested in, uh, you know, that we'd like to get to would be RNA molecules that are in the range of maybe 15 to 30, something like that, because we know uh, little bits of RNA of that size can assemble together and they can make complexes that are ribozymes, that are catalysts, they act like enzymes. Do you have any idea how RNA evolved into DNA with the substitution of uracil to thymine. How did that happen? Is that something that just falls out of the sky? Or <laughs> did, is anybody working on that particular issue? It's something we think about. Uh, there actually uh, has been uh, uh, some work suggesting that it's not actually that hard to make deoxynucleotides. And actually, if you think about what it would take to evolve a DNA polymerase enzyme, why would it happen unless there were already de deoxynucleotides around for it to polymerase, right? So, so maybe there are um, uh, chemical pathways that lead to deoxynucleotides. So maybe everything was there together early on, and you started off with a mixture, and they diverged. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's still a little bit mysterious. It's an interesting question. Now, the, the fact that ribosomes have RNA at their core, right. doesn't that mean, isn't that a ribozyme? Isn't that a... Yes, the, the ribosome yeah. is a ribozyme. Uh -huh. It's an RNA that makes all the proteins in our bodies and in all of modern life. Uh -huh. And that is definitely a relic of the RNA world. That's the smoking gun that there was an early stage of life where the main biopolymer, the main catalyst was RNA, because RNA is still making all of our proteins. There's a small group of people at Minari, I don't know, 10% of people who think that the RNA world is a viral world and that we evolve from viruses. So what's the difference between an RNA world and a viral world? So I have to say I don't really understand that argument because, you know, viruses are parasites on cells. By definition, a virus can't replicate itself. It needs to infect a cell. And so they can be... But in an RNA world, you're replicating yourself, right? You and have just... cells with, you know, oh. RNA genomes and RNA catalysts, and there's no reason why you can't have exchange between different kinds of cells back in the RNA world. And maybe there were viruses back then that mediated exchange. Well, what's the difference between viral RNA and an RNA world, a piece of RNA world DNA? I'm, I'm sorry, RNA in an RNA world and an RNA virus. Well, the, the, an, an RNA virus without cells to infect <laughs> can't really do anything. Well, right? then how does the RNA world do anything? Well, they are, that's just like you have you have cells, and they're growing and dividing. You have different lineages. They're evolving. Well, why do you call that an RNA world? I would have thought that's already have life. You have cells. You have RNA. And the you RNA world have is life. Have... We're talking about cells oh, I with thought... RNA genomes and catalysis by RNA enzymes. So, so I didn't. I, maybe I'm confused about this. Then an RNA world is exactly like a DNA world, except an R is substituted for a D is substituted for an R. And you know, I, I and in you the had early metabolism. stages, you yeah, you would have RNA catalyzed metabolism, not protein. But, not well, pro because in the earliest stages, as we just said, uh -huh. you didn't have the whole translational okay. the translational machinery to make proteins is really complicated. So you have a pre-ribosomal world, DNA-less right. world. Right. I see, and that's different from a viral world because viruses only have a protein coat and they don't have a lipid membrane or something. I mean, you could imagine all kinds of different RNA, I mean, modern RNA viruses, yeah, they have either membrane or protein or, you know, membrane protein coats, which could only be made in, in modern cells, right? But if we think about an RNA world with, you know, different kinds of cells, different species of RNA-based microbes, maybe you could have viruses that infect those, those cells. But there are no proteins in here. No coded proteins. No it could coded be, proteins. could no. be peptides. Um, uh, I mean, even in modern life, there are 
uh, a large class of peptides that are put together sort of one at a time by separate enzymes. Uh -huh. And I, I think that's a very interesting possibility for a, a step on the pathway of the evolution of protein synthesis. Are any of those proteins very, very deeply rooted and fundamental to the biochemistry of life? You mean the, the non-ribosomal... Yes, yes. Um, non uh, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, it, some of their aspects look kind of primitive in that they use um, thioester chemistry uh, to do the synthesis. But in terms of their phylogeny, I don't know how deeply rooted they are. Now, Christian de Duve, in his Vital Dust book that you have right, right. over there on your shelf, right. uh, said something like, life is a cosmic imperative. So what do you think of his arguments <laughs> for that? Are you, do you agree, disagree, neutral? You know, when, when, you, when you talk to people about this kind of question, you know, and it's, it's the same question of, are, you know, are we alone or is there life everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. People are passionately on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting because we just don't know. We don't have enough information, right? Uh -huh. And so the, it seems like the less information you have about a question, the more passionately people divide on the like one side or the other. Just like politics and religion. <laughs> Very much, yes. Okay. And so, you know, I'm, I, I would rather just think about the problems and try to come up with exper some experiments that will shed some light on the question. Well, how about Woes? Woes was somebody who uh, did a lot of experiments and a lot of evidence, but he also had more theoretical views. Uh, for example, he mentioned something called a Darwinian threshold in which I guess some soup of RNA got together and said, hey, here's a unit of selection, and then boop, Darwinism can start working. Do you, what do you think about this Darwinian, the Carl Woes' uh, idea of a Darwinian threshold? Well, <clears throat> to tell the truth, I, I, I never really understood what he was talking about in some of those ideas. I mean, if you have a, a, a kind of soup of... Macro molecules mac or something. Yeah, it just uh, it didn't make sense to me. I, I mean, I think, you know, you, you have mo most evolution is its selection on the, uh, at a cellular level. You know, different you know, cells and different species are competing with each other. Sure, there's some exchange, but exchange events are, are rare. It's not... I don't think it's really valid to think of, of everything as a kind of uh, homogeneous soup. But, but they get less and less rare as you go deeper and deeper. I thought horizontal gene transfer got more and more as you go further down. I, I, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I mean, uh, you, you see a lot of events on the phylogenetic tree, but that could still be, those, those events could be one every you know, 10 million generations. Right. That doesn't mean that it's basically one big So you soup. envision, as soon as you have a cell, you have a unit of selection, and presto, you have Darwinism working. Yes. And, and before fact, that? There's nothing, what about before that? Where you have, just say, if we were thinking about RNA molecules in solution and yes. not encapsulated, yes, 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 yes. then I, at that level, I think what you get are is a kind of lower level of selection or evolution. You, you would obviously, you, you would select for sequences that are easier to copy, for example. Uh, so better template sequences, maybe. Um, that sounds like a little like, at least a little like Darwinism. It, it's a, so as you sort of focus in on these earlier stages, right, it becomes a kind of gray area. And it's not like there's an instantaneous dividing line where, you know, here there's life and here there's just yes, chemicals, yes, right? And, and the but same most people thing, have that, right? Most well, people have alive or not. Alive yeah, or not. right, and they want to waste all their time thinking about the definition of, you know, <laughs> or the particular point. But in fact, if you think about evolution, yeah, in solution, maybe you'll have selection for better templates or, you know, but, but, but to evolve something more interesting like a metabolic catalyst without compartmentalization, that I think is just not going to happen. Right? Once, you have, once you have these molecules replicating in compartments, in, in cells, then you get to a much more interesting and open-ended uh, kind of Darwinian evolution where you can start to evolve all kinds of interesting metabolic and replication functions. Now, you say the word cells, and I, I meant probably most of the people in the world think, thought 
that the origin of life was single cells. But then the more I talk to people who study the earliest life forms on Earth, they're always talking about bacterial mats. They're always talking about groups and communities. And so I'm trying to get my, uh, and uh, so I'm thinking, okay, the first life was a community of, of a mat. But you're not talking, you're not using that language at all. No, I mean, uh, you know, again, the, these are these are highly evolved modern cells, right? They have all kinds of Well, they're the earliest ones we know of. Well, nothing on the modern life is early. It's all, all the Earth is, that we have now is the modern Earth, right? And, and, and uh, well, about you Luke? know, if you look back in the fossil record, okay, uh, you know, what, three billion years ago, roughly, you can see filaments. They probably were, but you see stromatolites, so there were communities and mats. Mm -hmm. That's a 3.5. I think it goes back that far. Yeah, well, yeah, it gets more and more dubious the earlier you go, right? Uh, but, you know, at, at the actual origin of the first cells from, from uh, spontaneously assembled membrane sheets and spontaneously formed little tiny fragments of RNA or whatever the most primitive genetic material was, I don't think you would necessarily have any way of making a, something as sophisticated as a, as a community of multiple species that are exchanging metabolites and so on. That's, that's the, 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 the end result of a long process of evolution. Hmm. And how is what your lab is doing different from, I guess, Steve Benner is doing or what Jerry Joyce is doing? Uh, you know, so, so uh, I think those are exactly the people who are closest to us in, in this whole area, right? I mean, Steve is very interested in, in uh, you know, what kinds of molecules can you make genetic polymers out of? You know, why do we have, for example, A, G, C, and T? Could you have other things? And, uh, you know, my conclusion from his 30 years of work on this problem is that making RNA or DNA any other way looks really hard. <laughs> so maybe we have the RNA and DNA we have because that's the easiest thing to make. Would, could one infer from that or guesstimate that therefore RNA and DNA are on other planets? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty interesting extrapolation. Um, you know, maybe. I, I think if you talk to John Sutherland, he would say, absolutely, yes. Chemistry is focused directly on RNA, and that would happen everywhere. I'm not totally so sure about that, uh, because we're still at pretty early stages of exploring this kind of chemistry. But it's definitely true that despite people looking at a lot of different backbone structures and a lot of different nucleotides, there's nothing to me that looks both easier to make, just chemically, and easier to replicate, and good at doing something functional, some useful job. I mean, RNA still looks the best. It doesn't mean that it's absolutely always going to be RNA. Maybe there's something we haven't found yet, but that's, that's what we see so far. A lot of uh, bioinformaticians are putting together increasingly deep and increasingly comprehensive phylogenetic trees. For example, there's a HUG paper in the Banfield group just came out a couple of months right. ago, and uh, the Pace tree from 1997. And, and are you, is your work at all informed by the sequences that have been identified at, in the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, from these phylogenetic trees? Uh, not very much. I mean, after all, we're we're thinking about, okay, from chemistry to the first cell, right? And then from that cell, the evolution, right? You'd have presumably evolution of many different species, the same kind of branching tree, but all the branches except one at LUCA died out. And there could be a billion years of evolution from that first cell up to LUCA. LUCA is basically like modern life, has, has RNA, DNA, ribosomes, all this stuff, right? right. Metabolism. It's basically already modern. So, so learning about how you got the first cell from something that had already had a billion years of evolution, it's, it's tough. There's, there's not a whole lot you can get directly from things like sequences. Now, there could be some exceptions. And one that I mentioned is if you look at the heart of RNA polymerase, there is a little acidic peptide that binds a metal ion that's catalytic. It looks like a little piece of prebiotic chemistry, 
in the heart of that enzyme. Now, and I, I don't know if that's, if that's really a link to the earliest chemistry or just convergent evolution, that that's just a good way of doing things. But it's pretty intriguing. What's this piece called again? There's a little acidic peptide in acidic RNA, peptide. In, in RNA um, polymerase. Acidic peptide. I mean, it just means a peptide, it has several aspartate residues. So they're, they're carboxylates, they can bind metal ions. Now, Paul Davies and I have written a couple of papers about second life. In other words, you mentioned the distance between the origin of life from maybe a billion years to LUCA. Mm -hmm. Now, and there could be many, many branches right. over here. And we're suggesting that maybe there are branches that are still extant that we just haven't recognized as life. What do you think of that idea? Um, I think you got to go and find it. Right? Find it, right? <laughs> well, we're trying to convince people to find it, but they're using primers based only on Luca stuff, and, and so I feel like they're looking under the lampposts, the kind right, of way. Right. Right. All right. So we can't convince you to. Now, how about there's a in astrobiology, and people who study evolution, for example, Simon Conway Morris, they go around collecting what they, he considers examples of convergence. Yes. And then when you have multiple mul things that have evolved independently, then become in an astrobiologist's mind the best candidates for th features that will evolve elsewhere. Right. What do you think of, but then there are other people like me who says, no, I'm a deep homologist. These vertebrate eye and the octopus eye have a biochemistry that is function uh, fundamentally the same and therefore the common ancestor of these two independently evolved eyes already had identical biochemistry from which it diverged. So what do you, tell me about that controversy. What is your... Okay, well, you know, one, one uh, extension of that is to go down deeper into the molecular level. And uh, so we did a, what I think is an interesting experiment in this regard a uh, long time ago, time, like 20 years ago. We took a large collection of RNA molecules with random sequences. Okay. And we said, okay, which molecules in this collection can bind ATP? And we kept getting the same solution, the same basic core sequence that would fold into the same three-dimensional structure again and again. These are RNA? These are RNA molecules okay. that fold up and they make a little binding pocket that's specific for ATP. And when you say they're different yeah. RNA molecules, you say like A, C, A, C, G. Yeah, right. we started off with the a population of 10 to the 16th independent random RNA Random sequences of nucleotides. Random sequences of okay. nucleotides. Okay. Okay. We got a, a lot out that could bind ATP and they all had the same kind of core you know, sequence motif. And then, a couple of years later, two other labs did essentially the same experiment, um, looking for molecules that could bind, um, I think it was, one was S-adenosylmethionine and another was maybe just adenosine. So they all have the same adenosine core. And they got the same answer again, okay? So it's convergent evolution in the sense that here's a problem, bind ATP, and again and again, independently, you will find the same answer, okay? Now, what happens if you say, okay, let's, let's ask the same question, but for binding GTP, okay? You take your collection of RNA molecules, you find the ones that combine GTP, and what do you get? A whole bunch of different solutions. Lots of different answers. So in the one case, it looks like convergent evolution. In the other case, it looks like lots, you, you know, in, 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 say you did this in different worlds, you'd get different answers. Do you have any idea which came first as an energy molecule, ATP or GTP? No, it could be the same. I, I don't think it's meaningful in that, I think in that sense. I think it's just, it's just saying that at the molecular level, uh, for some problems there is, uh, just by chance, just because of the, the statistical nature of the sequence collection, there'll be an answer that's the easiest and therefore the most common. Yeah. For other problems, there will be a lot of different solutions. And so sometimes, you know, if you, if you do the experiment again or, you know, replay the tape, right, sometimes uh -huh. you'll get the same answer, sometimes you'll get different answers. How does that qualify as a convergence? Because I'm a little bit confused because in chemistry, you take a bunch of chemicals and then these chemicals will combine to, to form water and these chemicals will combine to form something else. And we don't call, and if we do it again and again, it forms water and again and again, it'll form something else. I just call that chemistry, not 
anything that's convergent. But you put this chemistry in the context of, okay, I have a sequence, different sequences of RNA, 10 to the 16 or whatever it was, and then they fold it in a way. So you don't consider that to be deterministic chemistry. If it were deterministic chemistry, then we wouldn't call it convergence, we just call it chemistry. It, it, it is, it's at the interface, right? It is just chemistry. Uh, but these populations, these large populations of sequences, which are, are really basically a tiny sampling of sequence space, right? So, you know, if you think in the abstract of all possible sequences, right, we, we can only physically make in the lab a tiny, tiny fraction of that whole uh, set of possible sequences. And so you're starting off with this kind of arbitrary subset of possible sequences. And you let that population evolve to find solutions. And if you do independent evolutionary tracks, for some problems, you'll always get the same solution. Mm -hmm. For some problems, you'll get multiple different solutions. So that's the sense in which it's oh. convergent or divergent. Okay, so you put this debate about convergence versus deep homology in the context of chemistry. And so how about photosynthesis? Do you think uh, that... Uh, do you know anything about photosynthesis, whether it would evolve <laughs> elsewhere? Is that a, something that would be so complicated that it's so weird that we don't expect it elsewhere? Or is it a fact, a result of convergent chemical evolution? So... Uh, it's very useful. Yeah, of course. So, <laughs> yeah, it probably would evolve uh, elsewhere. Now, exactly the solutions that you found, of course, could be different if the spectrum of light that reaches the planetary surface is different, right? Sure, but why do you say it would probably evolve elsewhere? That you, that's, that's uncharacteristic of your normal diffidence. Well, I mean, assuming <laughs> that you have life that started on some other planet and it's got a sun and it's got... Uh -huh. But why couldn't it just do redox chemistry all the time and forget about it? It won't never happen upon the necessary molecules for, for autosynthesis. Well, I think the, the uh, high energy molecules that were available early on were probably in limiting supply and limited to certain restricted environments, right? So as life is starting to evolve and, and starting to adapt to different environments and, and, and spreading, right? If, as you evolve to be able to make use of more resources, you'll be able to, to spread uh, into new environments. And so what better resource to learn how to use than light? No, I, I agree with that, but I guess there may be, I don't know, thresholds of complicated, uh, really quirky things that have to happen in order to transduce that energy. Of course, yeah. It's, you're, you're not going to get a primitive protocell with a couple of <laughs> strings of RNA suddenly doing you know, class, right? <laughs> photosynthesis with, with the, you know, the, the two steps of, uh, uh, required to... to um, generate oxygen from water. It's a long, complicated process of evolution to But do you to use to energized, uh, photon energized molecules in any of your research? That's where cyanide comes from. Where cyanide is made in the atmosphere from uh, high energy ultraviolet photons. So HCN, I got it. So C comes from CO2 and N is just nitrogen and the H is from, I guess, hydrogen in the atmosphere? Or is that from water? Uh, yeah, I mean, you get some cyanide if you just have yeah, the water, CO2, and well, we nitrogen. Have, you get more if there's some methane around. You get have, a lot more. I mean, we have CO2 in the atmosphere. We have water in the atmosphere. And we have nitrogen. Oh, is there CN? Is there out this window here? Is there a so, HCN falling down from the sky? Yeah, but, you know, with, with oxygen in the atmosphere, that, uh, that doesn't really go. Okay, so it's just produced and then disappears. Yeah. Okay. All right. So how about, you know, Stephen Jay Gould talked about replaying the tape of life and what you would get. And I know this is a theoretical idea, but do you have any opinions about that? Or you just say that's just uh, bar talk? <laughs> well, I, 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 we already talked about the most relevant thing that we've done along those lines, which were, were okay. these RNA evolution experiments. Of course, Niles Lehman and other people, Jerry Joyce, have done experiments where they replay the tape of RNA evolution, right? And, and sometimes you repeatedly get the same sets of mutations because there's an easy solution to a particular problem. 
sometimes things start to diverge in interesting ways. So what do you see as the closest connection between what you're doing? Now, you could say, oh, you're just working on an earth problem, not on something out there problem. But, you know, out there is probably similar to earth in many, many, many ways. I, I'm sure there are places out there that are similar to the early earth. Right? Okay, but so then... It, There's a lot of places that are somewhat different. Mm. Like Jupiter. A little bit different. <laughs> like, it's a lot different. Right, right. There's so a whole the, range. So, okay, there's a whole range of Earth like planets. Now, the question is of the things that you're doing, you could conceptualize what you're doing as uh, I'm trying to understand how life got started on Earth, but some part of that, maybe all of it, is very relevant to how life got started, gets started elsewhere. Right. Can you make that distinction at all? No, in fact, one of the reasons that we're doing what we're doing is is to understand, in general, how easy it is, or would be, for life to emerge from the chemistry of a young planet. And that is... Not just Earth, direct, but a young but planet. Any Earth-like young planet, right. So we would like to... you know, If we can actually show from our lab experiments that all the steps on this pathway, from chemistry to life and, and on up to more complicated life, if, 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 if there's a connected pathway where all the steps are easy, then I would say, yeah, there's going to be life in lots and lots of places out there. If in doing these experiments we say, oh, here's a step that looks really, really hard. Maybe it would take a very, very special environment or uh, some event of very low probability. Then the conclusion might be different, right? The conclusion might be there's only life in a few places or maybe in the extreme, only here. But we won't know the answer to that until either we have a complete pathway from lab experiments or one of our astronomer friends actually gets convincing evidence of an independent origin of life somewhere else. If they get an independent origin of life by finding life in some exoplanet, we will then be totally convinced when we go back into the lab that there is an easy pathway and so we should work, you know, even we should be even more confident that our experiments will work out. Now, astrophysics physicists are trying to figure out if there are any biosignatures that they can find that life, however you want to define it, produces in an atmosphere. Do you think there, now the big problem with that is, hey, what's biotic, what's a biotic signal, what is yeah, an abiotic right, signal, right, separating right. those two. It, can you provide right. any help to these guys? Well, we talk to people like that a lot, all the time. And uh, what do you say to them? Well, you know, I, I, think, I think we all agree that it's, it's not an incredibly simple problem. There's, there's not going to be like one easily detectable atmospheric gas that is a you know, slam dunk conclusive signature that there's life. It's going to be maybe detecting s several different things or some, some unexpected mixture of gases in the context of knowing a lot about the planet, its mass, its, uh, you know, its orbital parameters, how much, how much light it's getting, its surface temperature. You know, want to know a lot about the planet so that you could understand the evolution of the planet and its atmosphere to let you interpret the atmospheric spectroscopy. So you think it's not easy to tell the difference between volcanic fumes and bacterial mat excretions? Well, you know, if, if they're both giving rise to, say, methane and, and, and sulfur gases, yeah, it could be um, hard to tell. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, uh, Will, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to break through Listen, so SETI. What do you think of SETI? I, I think it's a great thing to do. You know, it's, uh, I, I love experiments that are, are long shots, you know, I mean, they... They're very risky, but the payoff would be almost infinite, right? So I think that's great. Uh, do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? <laughs> uh, no, not really. I mean, I think there's, there's just still too many unknowns, right, to think about it really um, in any depth. And what kind of, now, talk, now you've talked to me with your rational side of your brain, but Freud tells us that 95% of our brain is kind of irrational, emotional things. So what kind of aliens would you like to find with your emotional side? <laughs> well, you know, I'm a big uh, Star Trek fan, so oh, that'd be awesome, right? <laughs> you find <laughs> Captain a, Kirk? Go and have Spock. a drink in the bar with a bunch of different aliens. <laughs> so you're a, big, you're a big Star Trek fan. I see. So uh, 
all the different life forms. They uh, uh, there are many different types of life forms that these That's Hollywood right. producers have thought of, <laughs> <laughs> and you just enjoy. You're entertained by them. Or do you take any of them seriously enough? No, to, no, no, of course not. Right? Of course I mean, not. We're you know we're we're working at a much simpler level. So uh, you know I'd be ecstatic if we can, uh, you know, get some convincing biosignatures. Now, a lot of us working in astrobiology are working on like the big picture of how we got here. And uh, do you think that's important to work on, or if so, why? I mean, a lot the, of people don't care. The whole field of the origin of life is a big picture field, right? right it's right. all about how we got here. Yes. So yeah, obviously, I think. But a lot of people important. don't care. People say, "How do I get here? I don't care. I, I'm going to." Yeah, I, I think I disagree with that. I think this is a, a field where the, there's incredible public interest in the origin of life and in exoplanets. People love this stuff. It's very popular because people are interested because in how we got Star Trek here. Because they've Star Trek Well, or, you know, I think people, everybody at some level wants to know how we got here. Yes. Yes. Well, in some way, it's kind of like, uh, oh, another way in which science is replacing religion. Great. Great. <laughs> okay. So you're working on artificial life. So what's taking you so long? Why haven't you already produced life forms? <laughs> You have a grant that ran out. You didn't push a life form. We're not going to re refund you. <laughs> uh, you know, these are these are, are, are hard questions. Um, you know, the answer doesn't come in a flash because uh, you take a complicated problem, you've got to break it apart into smaller problems and down to the level of, you know, simple questions that are actually answerable you know, by a, a student doing their PhD thesis, for example, and it takes a lot of these little pieces to, to put everything together. And we're trying to reconstruct things that happened a long time ago where we have very indirect evidence. So it's, it's not simple when you approach this problem just trying to think about how things happened. Ironically, perhaps, when we get answers to some of these smaller questions, you know, we go like, oh, why didn't I think about that earlier? It's so simple. Mm -hmm. right? but, but before you have the answer, it's not obvious. Okay. And uh, how about any opinions on Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, Lovelock and Margulis? Was it? You know, the biosphere. Who, yeah, yeah. Are... No, I'm trying to think. Who, who, who was it who said, I have no need of that hypothesis? That, yes, that was, no, that, that was Laplace, La I Laplace think. Or... I think it was Laplace. Laplace. Could have been, yeah. I think it was like, after uh, Napoleon in yeah. Egypt yes, right, in 1799 right. or something. Right. He read his book and said, yeah. uh, "Where's well, God where's in here?" God in here. I have no need of that hypothesis. So you don't. So you don't need. That's your reaction to the guy hypothesis. Yes. Okay. Um, now you have students. What do you think? And what do you think the public or students' biggest misconceptions are about the origin of life? Um. Misconceptions. They just think it's too easy, maybe, for example. <laughs> they don't know how hard it is, or they... Uh... Yeah, I, I guess I don't really know how to answer that. Okay, so now this MOOC we're making here is for students, not necessarily scientists, so a lot of the chemistry yeah. we just talked about will be completely incomprehensible, but uh, do you have any advice for students about how to, to think about this problem? Should they all become biochemists, or...? Well, you know, if we're, if we're talking about the origin of life, we're talking about how you went from simple chemistry to more complicated chemistry to simple biology to more complicated biology, right? So if you actually want to understand those steps, you have to become a chemist and a biochemist. I mean, that's just what you need to understand these processes. And, and to do that, you need to understand a lot, of, a lot of physics, a lot of different branches of chemistry. It's not just organic chemistry, it's physical organic, it's inorganic, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of biophysical interesting problems. It, the whole field is interesting because it, it actually draws on almost every aspect of science and we're trying to put all these things together to figure out a coherent pathway. So uh, the more you can learn about any uh, aspects of, of math, physics, chemistry, and biology, the better equipped you'll be to understand or even work on these problems. Okay, and uh, last question, are we alone? <laughs> I'd like to find out, hopefully in my lifetime. <laughs> okay.